here we go. Okay, designing with negative space. So what I'm gonna to do tonight is I'm gonna talk a little bit about the direction my journey is currently taking. Um, also, of course, what is negative space? And why is it important? We'll look at ways to consider negative space when working with a, a designing a work. And I'm gonna finish off with a demonstration of putting these ideas into practice. I'm going to be using a jelly plate and simple stencils as tools to practice the design process. Now, people go to workshops to learn. That's kind of standard, everybody knows that. But the, the surprising thing, or not surprising thing, is that instructors also learn when they teach. They learn about the topic during the presentation. You have to know the subject matter well enough to easily communicate it to other people. And instructors also learn from their students, directly and indirectly. Sometimes a student will do something that you haven't seen or considered before. Uh, but you also learn by how your students react to what you're teaching. So if it's like this big aha moment for them, and you're going, well, oh, I didn't realize that was that, you know, like important, then that's something that you take away and you, and you work with. Uh, last year, I was asked by the FCA to become one of their foundation series instructors. The topic that I was assigned was elements of design. During the preparation for that course, I revisited the seven elements of design and their roles in art. So the elements of design are the tools that we have that we can create uh, artwork with. They are the ingredients, so to speak. We can combine them in all sorts of different ways, but basically we only really have line, shape, value, form, space, texture, and color. Exploring this material really interested me. And after the class was over, I decided to see how could I improve the use of these elements in my own work? Down the rabbit hole I went. <laughs> Thus began the journey down the rabbit hole. The purpose of a rabbit hole is exploration with no expectation of any presentable pieces. You start with something that catches your interest and I've never had a chance to explore. So I say, I'm gonna go back to that and I'm gonna take some time and look at it. There is only one rule uh, when you follow a rabbit hole and that is when you think it, do it. Not tomorrow, not later this afternoon, don't stop for lunch. When you think it, do it. Because if you don't, you'll forget about it. And you'll forget about that flash of curiosity and insight that happened when you thought about it. So rabbit hole of, nine, of 2022. I was talking to uh, my Central Okanagan FCA mentees last winter, the group that I was uh, mentoring, about repetition with variation. And it got me thinking about the use of stencils. I've used stencils before, but only in a very limited way. I didn't want to use commercial stencils. I wanted to have my own custom stencils, but my arthritis is at a point where I can't do extensive cutting with my hands anymore. So then I discovered you could, you could cut your own custom stencils on a Cricut cutter. There's other brands as well, but that's kind of the one that's available locally at Michael's. And you can create or refine your images on the computer. Uh, you can sketch something and then photograph it and put it onto the computer, or you can start with a photograph itself and then, and then work with that if you want to. Uh, and then you basically just send it to the machine and the machine just sits there and cuts it out. Now the tree stencils that I used in, I'll show you that painting uh, in a minute. The stencils that I used for my big tree as I fondly thought of it, um, those, each one of the stencils, there was four stencils, and each one of them took that machine over a day to cut out. So, you know, it's not it, it, simple stencils, like a square or a circle or something like that. Uh, you can just stand there and it just cuts it and you just take it and away you run. But if you're doing something really, really intricate, it can take quite a while to cut it out. I have no idea how much it would, how long it would take a person to cut those by hand. So, I started off initially 
And I was thinking kind of conventionally about the painting and I was trying to fit my stencils into my existing work. Um, I was uh, taking it and I was, you know, I had a stencil of a, of a flower or some chunk of grass. And I was either putting paint through the stencil or I was putting a uh, textured medium through the stencil and adding it to a work and trying to build it up like a bouquet. Okay, here's one flower and then here's another. And I have that one and I'll show it to you. It's what I consider the baggage of the past. It just really wasn't taking me anywhere. I, I wasn't finding it interesting, but then I had a happy accident. So I, when you're applying all that goo through the stencils and then you lift the stencil off, there's still quite a lot of goo left on the stencil. So I took one of those gray pieces of palette paper that you can buy for mixing your paints on and I just put the stencil down on it and I scraped all the goop off and I put the goop back in the jar. And the next day when I came in the studio, there was this really interesting image on the palette paper. And what it was, was it was glossy where the goop had gone through, even just a tiny little bit. And it was just gray everywhere else. So the color didn't really change, but the, the glossiness did. So that was really interesting. And then the light bulb kind of went off in my head. Instead of creating something with the stencil, I could use it to protect something under the stencil. So this was where I was back in, in January. And the works that you would have seen perhaps at um, uh, the art show that the Kelowna Peter Studio had in, in uh, Peachland in February, March, that, those were done uh, that way. So this is basically what it would look like. Um, I had some yuko and I, you know, I really don't like yuko because if I put yet watercolors, yuko is a synthetic paper. So it's plastic. It's considered paper, but it's not paper like what we would normally have made of cotton or made of wood. It's made of some form of plastic material. Mm -hmm. And when you put your watercolor on it, Sometimes you can kind of control it, but most of the time it kind of goes kind of where it wants to. And uh, a good watercolor painter could control it. I'm not a good watercolor painter. So when I was using it, it, it was kind of looking like that. You know, I'd put the watercolor on in some colors, some purples and some uh, greens, and some would stay where I put it and some just ran all over the place. But that was okay. You call being a synthetic paper, you can take it like literally to the sink and wash off the watercolor. So what I did was I put my stencil down, I applied the gel medium through the stencil to protect the areas of what I was had on my stencil, in this case, a bunch of leaves. And then when I washed it off, I got that. So to me, that was just fascinating. It was a nice crisp image, which is kind of my thing. You know, I don't like mushy stuff. Uh, so then I, that was for me a, a milestone because now I found a way to use the stencils that I was creating in a way that excited me. Uh, so I started to devote more time into designing the stencil to be the composition instead of just a component. And that was the difference between the baggage of the past and what I started to do from there. So what I had basically was I now had a repeatable image. I had something that I could try and uh, work with different placements, different colors, different mediums, different surfaces. I did some on black. You know, I did, I did them on all kinds of different things. I started trying um, watercolor uh, ground. You know, that stuff that allows you to paint watercolor on anything. Well, I would apply that through my stencil on something black, for example, going from there. So basically I ended up um, trying out all kinds of different things. But what it allowed me to do was it allowed me to focus on the elements of design. I could take the stencil and decide where should it be placed on my little surface? What colors, textures do I want to have on it? And like I say, I went through flowers, I went through uh, birds and branches, I went to the large, the big tree stencil, which is 20 by 20, it's a fairly large painting. And more recently, I've gone to uh, some botanicals. So, um, yeah. Now, mind you, I did give up on Yupo. <laughs> I gave up on Yupo because I was having a lot of difficulty permanently mounting it in a way 
that I could exhibit it not going to class. I didn't want to frame under glass. Uh, and UPO, I found out, although you can temporarily affix it to a cradle panel, it will also often form bubbles underneath. So I, I was able to firmly fix a few of them, but in a lot of the other ones that I created, I had trouble getting them permanently fixed onto a cradle panel. But anyway, let's get back to negative space. First of all, what is it? In this piece by Renata Kerr, who used to be a chapter uh, member, she's in Victoria now, she's a member down there. Uh, the positive shape of the bird divides the canvas into two uneven halves. <laughs> On either side of the bird, there are light colored negative shapes. If the bird was placed differently, the painting would not have been as interesting. The negative shapes are as important to the design of this painting as the positive shape itself. In this painting by chapter member Diana Hilliard, uh, this is a prime example of an interesting use of negative space. The only positive shapes in the painting are the dog and the chair legs. All the other shapes are negative shapes. The larger, more broadly painted, anchor the lower part of the painting itself. The smaller negative shapes support the areas of interest up and around the dog. And there's a lot of negative shapes here. You know, there's, uh, oh, can you maybe, oh, there we go, there's my cursor. There's a larger negative shape here. And then there's little negative shapes under the leg. The shadow, of course, is a negative shape. Little one right there behind the head. Little one over there between the nose and the chair leg. All of those things just help draw the eye up into the area and then around the area of interest. As jurors, uh, we see a lot of paintings with the object in the center of the painting. So flowers, portraits, animals, this tends to be um, a bit of a habit of people. The space around and behind the objects is just not all that interesting. So if you had a, a photograph like that, um, often we would see it crop something similar to that, sort of just floating in the middle, there's sort of nothing touching the edges, and the negative spaces aren't all that important to this piece. It's mainly just about the daisies. However, um, you could also crop it more like that. And this is not like a perfect cropping, this is just to, to show you the difference. So now we have negative space up and across the painting that's quite interesting. It comes Here's my cursor, there we go, comes down and engages the daisies in here and around in here. The daisies touch the edges, creating negative space in and around the bottom and back out. And this leaf here also kind of divides negative space into that side and that side. So the first place to consider your negative space in your design is at the point where you crop your reference. When you're cropping your reference, you know, try out different places. You know, everybody's got their little phone or tablet or whatever, and you can bring it in and there's always a little crop tool and you can move it around. Try out different pay placements and consider the negative spaces that you're, you're creating as well as just where your focal point is. This is one of my paintings, <coughs> excuse me, and it involves a cruciform design. So uh, the tree trunk itself is on the rule of thirds here. And the landmass behind in the distance is the other part there that forms uh, the basic shape of a, a cruciform. Cruciform armatures tend to be very solid, but they can be somewhat static. So the negative shapes in here, uh, the negative shapes around the branches, and the sky holes, they kind of are lacy. They're, uh, there's you know lots of little ones, bigger ones, and they lead the eye around the painting. So it's less static than it would be as if we were just painting in a more solid way. <laughs> we can hear people walking upstairs. It's interesting. <laughs> they are, yeah. At least they're not thundering. You can hardly hear the music. So what do you see first when you're looking at this painting? Now, this is where the, the, the live audience can chip in if you like. 
What what do you what do you just see first when you just glance at it? Yeah. So some people might see the, the, the big orange and yellow leaves. There's bright leaves down here, a little bit of purple. So let's take a look behind the scenes at how this painting was designed. So I was looking for a good value structure. And so I reduced uh, the values to just two. Uh, this is called a no-tan. A no-tan involves just black and white. And it's very useful way to look at different structures. So here I took a just a you know sharpie marker thing. Uh, this was my initial little sketch, uh, little notes here on color scheme. Uh, and I just sort of blocked off what would be the darkest areas, what would be the lightest areas. And I did basically three of these. This one's the first one, and then second, and then third. And it just takes you a couple of minutes to try them out. And the one that I went with in the end was the, the one that I did first. Uh, that one was the one that I found was most useful. So what I do then is when I'm actually painting the painting, I try to follow that pattern. So yes, I'm looking at the reference, but I'm also looking back at that little note tab and remembering where my darkest darks have to go in the, and the lightest lights. Now, three values is also very useful. Uh, I like to use toned paper for thumbnail sketches, especially when I'm doing plein air. Uh, the toned paper gives me the first value, it's a mid value. And then I'll use um, white charcoal pencil and a soft graphite pencil. And that gives me my darks and my lights. So lights, mid ground, mid tones and, and darks. Um, this helps you focus in on the shapes rather than the things. And it allows you to see the design elements more clearly. Uh, in this scene, which was at the uh, Federation retreat last September up in the Caribou, this block of trees in the back was just a solid block. It was just straight. And this was kind of straight too. It sort of just gave me a negative space of a big kind of ugly square. So I decided to just break into that a little bit, making this white negative space a bit more interesting. And then it also allowed me to focus in on this white negative space in the background here and uh, over where the center of interest was, was going to be. So it kind of let me try out the major shapes. I'm not thinking about roads and trees and sky and whatever, uh, just taking a look at how the whole things interact. So that brings me around to the point that I really wanted to focus on and which my demonstration is going to be focused on. And that is, if you want to improve your design skills, then you're going to have to work at it. <laughs> and often, subject matter, painting techniques, mixing skills, they just get in the way. So when you want to focus at design, what you're looking for is simple, direct practice. No painting, no drawing, no subject matter to, to distract you from that goal, only design. So how do you make it that simple? Uh, I recommend using a gel plate. Uh, you can make it yourself uh, or you can buy a jelly plate from Opus. They have them there. Um, you can start off with just a small one. Five by seven is a really good size to start off with. I've, I'll be demonstrating on an eight by 10 tonight and I've got some larger ones too, but the small is actually better. It makes you think more just about the shapes. Um, what I use is I just use simple masks and stencils uh, cut from paper uh, for the shapes. So you remember the design elements, uh, line, shape, you know, um, well, I've, got, I've got the list right, right in front of me here. Um, then I found I like to use uh, different kinds of thread for lines. So if I want a loopy intricate line, I can drop the thread on in kind of a complex way. If I want straight lines, I can just put it on the plate uh, in a tight straight line. Now you're going to get free texture from your jelly plate. It's, it's pretty hard to pull something that's perfectly even. And the things that you put on your plate will leave different kinds of textures as well. You can also add textures, but like I said, it's kind of free. And then I also recommend you to keep your color palette really simple so that you can focus on design rather than starting to get distracted by, by color. Using this, um, mediums, have been eliminated from the question from the equation. If you do not like to draw, 
um, if you have hangups with mixing paint or anything else, that's all gone. It's all been eliminated. Basically, there is only design. Roll and repeat. So that's the nice thing about the jelly plate. It takes two minutes to just roll on some paint, try some different shapes, try some different objects, print them onto some inexpensive paper, and then roll and repeat. It's not so much about the revelations that you're looking for. It's about controlled focus practice to, to improve your design skills. And now I'm gonna go ahead and do a demonstration. Any uh, any questions at this point? Oh yeah, yeah. So you're gonna need a prayer for sure. Oh, I, I had to undo this USB thing, my doodle here, which I'll plug back in to get our video back. There we go. Okay. Yes, you do need a brayer, but you know, the plate and the brayer all together, you know, not that much. They last forever. So uh, it's not too much of a problem. Now, um, you know, the people, now here we go. Here's a reason for all you people in Zoom land why you could have come tonight and you would have gotten more from it than sitting at home. <laughs> I, I have with me a whole stack and I decided to. Um, that I wanted to 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 really focus on design. I'm going to go around to these. I'd like people on Zoom to be able to see these as well. Um, I have a whole stack here, which the people who, who are attending can take some time and go through. But these are ones that I've made with nothing more than circles, thread. Um, there's the odd one in here that involves um, a bit of grass and some squares and stuff like that but this is this is what i spent quite a i didn't actually spend i spent about a week doing these i guess so anyway you guys can take a look at those if you want and um where did i put the other ones oh here they are and these are some examples of, of some larger ones that I've done. So this is one where you know the colors actually played a little a little bit of a bit of a bigger part. Um, this is one that I was trying to get sort of a collagey type look on it. So I was doing little pieces here and there. This is a very simple one, but I wanted to see if that would kind of be enough. So, you know, just again, you're just experimenting with um, different patterns and stuff to see what might work and what might not. This is about this one involves um, two layers of botanicals in kind of an interesting way. And if you look here, the negative spaces are kind of regular, like they're kind of the same size and things. So not as interesting in that. Um, this one is just kind of like a big fat tail because the second layer of flowers didn't really go where I expected them to go. And I ended up with just one big lumpy negative space. And then I also tried, uh, and these ones will be coming around for you guys. Um, I also tried doing some different designs. Like how about if I take some, uh, I believe these were radish leaves. And I put four on a plate because, you know, let's break the rule about being odd numbered. And uh, I, I printed them that way. This one, I was quite pleased with the design of that one. I thought the negative spaces and the design of that one were quite uh, pleasing. Uh, and then this is back in, in my, you know, the tree stencils. Anyway, so I'm going to circulate those around the room too. You can just take a moment if you want to through, or you can just. Pass them along. All right, and now I hope my other tablet's still online. The Wi Fi is actually turning out to be quite good here. So um, there we go. Okay. So let's, let's get, let's get, uh, painting. So um, uh, one of the things, by the way, that I've found, and I was just fortunate to own um, 
a, a whole set, not a whole, well, a big enough set anyway, of the open acrylics. I find that the you can do this process with regular acrylics, but boy, you got to be quick. With the opus open ac acrylics, I have like all day. I can fiddle around with placement. You know, things don't dry right off the bat. Stuff doesn't get stuck to your plate. So um, it's really it's really worthwhile, I think, um, having these. So, but you don't have to. You can do them with any kind of acrylic that you like. So I'm just going to start off. I'm going to put out a little bit of black. Um, black is is a good basic neutral. Mm. If you have any questions or comments while we're going, just uh, let me know. And I'm going to um, kick in some anthraquinone blue. I can also be using ultramarine blue here, but I just wanted to get you know away from straight black. Oh, okay, I'll do that after. So you take a brayer, and uh, I have several, but uh, this one's a, a decent size. Um, pick up your paint. By the way, just there's a little learning curve to using the brayer and, and getting the paint out. And there's really, really good YouTubes on uh, the internet about that. So uh, definitely worthwhile spending a bit of time. So, Judy. Kit, yeah. this, is your, this is your gelled plate, right? This is the jelly. Plate. That's the jelly. Okay. This is the jelly plate. It's uh, this wobbly wobbly, if you know jello, you know, it, it kind of looks like that, but it's solid, does not need to be kept in the fridge. You can either make them or you can uh, just uh, buy one. I, I weighed off the difference between the cost of getting all the ingredients. <laughs> I decided it was just expeditious to go ahead and, and, uh, and buy it. So what I have now, um, let me see if I can get these into the demonstration zone. Um, is I've got a bunch of stuff. I've got, you know, some papers. I've got squares. I've got squares with the centers cut out. Um, sometimes those are quite interesting. Sometimes I'll put them down inside uh, the jelly plate. Sometimes I'll maybe take it right off the edge. Uh, I've got lots of circles. I love circles. Circles are, are really interesting. Um, so this is where you start to think about, you know, where would this look? You know, what would look good? What would be balanced? If I put that there, maybe I can have something like that over there. Um, might like a little bit of texture down there just to fill that out. So now I've got various shapes and elements kind of in there. And if I want to get some line in there, and you know, you just, I have a really, really long piece of thread here. It's just great. So if I want straight lines, I could lay it out, you know, pull it and make it straight. But I kind of like the loopy line. So you know, and this is one thing that you find out. I didn't know I liked loopy lines. I found that out by doing this. You know, and I take some of them right off the edge. You know, bring them back. And, well, I think that's plenty. That's plenty. So the open acrylic lets me play with that and gives me some time to kind of set the plate up and say, yeah, you know, I think that's going to work. I'm going to try that and see what I learn. So I will print. If I'm just fooling around, uh, I'll print on copy paper, or if I want something a little stiffer, I'll print on cardstock. And cardstock is not very expensive at Michael's. You buy it, you know, with your little 40% off coupon. Um, and I've also got tissue here, and I'll discuss tissue in a minute. So one roll up of paint on the jelly plate. Uh, is going to give me at least four prints. So the first one is going to be uh, all the shapes that I put in here are going to be white. They're blocked out. And everything else is going to be very dark because I started off with very dark paint. So that's the first one. So 
very graphic. You know, you look at it and you say, well, how's the balance? You know, if I turn it around different ways, am I kind of creating something here that's kind of interesting? One thing I'm noticing is that this, this corner seems to be not part of the conversation very much. So what I might do is say, well, I'll just bring through a little thread over there to involve it a little bit more in the conversation. Now, part of the uh, ink is gone from the plate, uh, but there's still tons of, of ink there. So I'll do a second pole. This is the shape poles. So these poles are kind of the negative spaces, and the negative spaces around the objects that are put on the plate. So this, you can see that it's, it's not as dark. Um, I've been able to involve this section a little better. The, the whole flow of it is kind of interesting. So this is how we this is how we learn. And often it's not at the moment. It's when I review them because you get so carried away. It's just it's such a good time. It's like Ooh, wee. Now, um, one thing I'll do is I will uh, use tissue to get rid of excess paint on the plate. If I um, for the next section. Now, if you are going to use the tissue in the future for collage work, then for gosh sakes, use art quality tissue. Don't use the stuff at the dollar store. This is the stuff at the dollar store, uh, and it's just to clean off the plate. Some people use newspaper. I find newspaper makes a mess on the plate, so I just use this cheap tissue. So this cheap tissue, although I could keep it for information purposes, I would never put it into a piece of art. However, you know, it's not that expensive. You can get the art tissue at Opus. Uh, and they cut, see, that's kind of pretty too. So a lot of people make these, uh, use tissue a lot, and then they'll collage them. So if that's your thing, you know, that's great. Now what we get to do, is the exciting part. So imagine that, you know, you guys were asking earlier about the tree stencil, right? So imagine that this was the tree stencil. I've now taken all of the paint off between branches. So all that's left now is the branches. And that's how I print the tree. So get rid of, the, get rid of this stuff. Let's see the thread. Um, and then you see these. Now, sometimes I'll wash these. I don't have the washing stuff with me today. Uh, sometimes I try to keep them clean. Sometimes I don't worry about it. I just let the paint build up. I put them jammy side up uh, so that I don't mess up <laughs> my work surface. Jammy side up. I keep trying to remember that. And different materials. Like some of these are cut out of the Duralar stuff. Some of these are cut out of like just a magazine cover, something a little stiffer than straight paper. Um, and they'll leave different kinds of textures. So now I've got a, a print to pull that's going to be quite dark. It's, it's going to be, uh, it's what's called a ghost, a ghost image. If you're watching jelly plate videos, that's, this is now you can pull the ghost and that's what that's called. Mm -hmm. So this is different. Now I'm pulling the objects instead of pulling the negative spaces. So this will teach me something else. These prints taught me one thing about my knit because they reinforce the idea of the negative spaces. This one will teach me more about how I've kind of placed the objects and how does that look? So again, this is all information. It's all grist through the mill of you know working with your design skills. Now you'll notice that that uh, stuff that I added down in this corner is lighter because I'd already taken a layer of paint off before I added that, added that, okay? Anyway, so, you know, now this is not the end of this, however. There is still um, paint on there. Now, if I wasn't interested in this, I could just say, oh, well, I could just say, well, that's the end of that, and I could just create the plate. Like I said before, roll and repeat. But uh, there is more plate in here, so I was just going to show you uh, what comes off on the fourth print. So I rolled up paint on here and I'm getting basically four prints out of it. So this is lighter, it's more subtle. Tells me something different, you know, about the, the shapes and all the rest. So 
you know, which print you actually in the end like the best, it could be any one of those four um, that you that you played with. So any questions at this point about, you know, the, uh, the idea behind that or? So now can you go back in and, and do another color on top of these if you wanted? Absolutely. And I just give them, now remember, we are using the gold, the, the open acrylic, so they take a little longer to dry, uh, or at least I am in here. Um, but yes, you can absolutely let it dry, go in with another color and um, overlap. So, um, you know, it might, if you're trying to explore design and increase your design skills, you might use just like a, an analogous color palette, something very, you know, very simple. Uh, or you might think more of value. You might say, okay, I'm going to take this strong first pole, which is really dark, but then I'm going to put something else on, and I'm going to use this paper for the second pole and see what happens when I combine a medium value with this dark one. You can go back and add more shapes. Uh, so, for example, if I said, well, I like this, but I need blah, blah, blah up here. You could go ahead and pick up the plate, get the plate to the state where you've got that, whatever it is you want to add, and then just, you just print it again. So you can modify the design um, as you go. Those little ones that I was handing around, some of those have two or three uh, or four layers of paint on. You just you decided to add an extra circle or make a darker tone, whatever. What about fluid acrylics? You can use fluids and they work fine. The high flows will resist the plate a bit. You'll get white spots in with the high flows, but the fluids are good, but they will dry fast. So trying to, you know, take some time and do the placement and all the rest of that stuff, that you may have to do that <laughs> a little bit more quickly. Mind you, once you get started with this stuff, it's just a blast. And you know, especially if you're just using copy paper, you know, you'll you'll end up um, going through. You know, I, I end up after a 20 minute printing session, or, or you know, like at 45 minutes, I've got a Martin full of prints. They're everywhere. They're just you know, everywhere I can put them to draw. You know, so what's that? I'm allergic to oil, so no, I just don't work with oil. But you can use oil on the gel plate. That's a uh, I, I know there's people that do that. That would dry very slowly. So that might be good, a good thing in terms of, um, you know, having time to work with the plate and put your images on and that sort of thing. Um, so I've also been working with um, this stuff. So this plant metal, uh, organic stuff. And I've been, you know, combining it a little bit with uh, the geometrics because I never was able to do that when I was painting. When I was painting, I always wanted to kind of step sideways a little bit into geometric abstraction of my work. And I was never able to do that. I, I don't know why, but here I can. So, you know, it, yay. So um, I'm just thinking now, of if I put these down, how would the negative space look? Uh, and I'm just looking for a piece like this one, I think would just be kind of busy trying to print with that. Um, some of these, I think that, you know, if you sort of have them kind of off the side, that might work. But I think I kind of like this one. So if I had it on the plate like that, then what kinds of geometric elements might be interesting to add to that? Um, to make it more of a you know broader composition. Any idea? Circles. circles. Let's put some circles on. So I'm not sure really huge circles would work, but hmm, you know, I'm kind of feeling that one. Maybe something in there. And this is where it's kind of nice. I have a whole box full of bits at home. We didn't bring them all. 
Let's see if I can just break up the space a little bit. Now, what I put underneath will be the strongest in the overall design, because that will be what will be printed here. I think so. Yeah, okay. I've got that idea. I can move that up. So um, I'm sticking with what I put out. I mean, I, there's all kinds. I like uh, transparent red iron oxide. It's a really good one to, to use. But I've already got all this expensive paint on my palette. So you, know, you get what you get. I, I really like dioxazine purple on this too. Um, and dioxazine purple with um, a bit of transparent red iron oxide is really, really nice. Um, but boy, dioxazine purple is so powerful. I just put a tiny, tiny bit on the plate, and that's all you need. Now I'm just touching the plate again with the brayer. I'm taking a little bit of the paint off. I'm not wanting to go quite as dark. By the way, there's some really interesting marks you can make with the brayer itself that you can add in, right? In different colors and stuff like that. But hey, we've only got so much time, right? So wait, where did I say this was? This was going over here. Yeah. What about there? And then I got thicker line. Try that. There. I'm not going to put the whole thing in there. Okay. Now, sometimes the vegetation cooperates, and sometimes it flips over before you manage to get your paper in there. So you get what you get, and you got to live with that, and that's a good lesson to learn. Okay. Now, the I don't usually take. Uh, I usually do use tissue for the first pull and just get rid of the some of the paint on the plate, but I'll put it on paper. It's a little easier for you guys to see. And you have to rub it in. One of the nice things about the jelly plate is it's, you can push your thumb into it, right? So when you've got an object on the plate, um, you can kind of press into it and you're going to get a good impression of it. And one thing that's nice about the tissue, you can see through it when you're doing this. So you can tell if you're getting a certain area or not. Would you ever rub a dry layer over top of that? I have, yeah. I've, I've done that for sure. I mean, um, I find that for this type of thing with this big a stem, maybe not so much, but yeah, for, for regular flat stencils, we can definitely just layer it and put the pressure on like that. I think everybody ends up with a preferred um, well, that's not it. That's quite interesting. I think everybody ends up with preferred methods of doing it, whether you like doing it with your hand or whether you like doing it with the brayer. So that's that. That's the first pull. Now, the next one is actually one that might be a little bit more interesting in terms of not quite as high contrast. You could serve as a, like you say, as a foundation for maybe a second print over top or second color. When you're using something really dense like that, is it better to use the heavy paper or does that matter? I use what I find the best for the, the stuff that's kind of thick is the high quality tissue. The high quality tissue will pull that paint off for you, but it'll kind of get in and around the heavy bits. But it won't fall apart like the cheap tissue. So that's kind of interesting. I could definitely see taking that and then doing a further layer in a, in a different color. So now um, let's try this. I've got quite a nice jammy side up. <laughs> uh, now, the question here would be whether I pull it now um, or I take the plastic off. I think I'm going to try pulling it here because that will be interesting. My geometrics will be white instead of, uh, but I'm not going to apply a lot of pressure. I'm just do it really light. So now I get the geometric elements really interestingly in white. And I don't think you guys at home can see, there's quite an interesting bit of plating back here. It's not as boring as it. Is it works, but you know, that's kind of interesting. Yeah. So 
Uh, unfortunately, that's most of the ink that showed the botanicals. So when I take the rest of this off, I'm going to get something very, very light. But it'll, that can be very interesting too. And it could be the foundation for another uh, layer. Here. This one I'll give a real good rub to and see if I can't get the rest of it. By using the open acrylics, I've never had ink dry on my plate, but when I was using the other acrylics, that does happen. But then you just pull it with another layer of paint or medium. So lots and lots of YouTubes on uh, about, about that. That is, that is quite fascinating. Yeah, that one is quite interesting. So I like it because I don't have to think about how am I going to draw that leaf. To me, it's not a leaf anymore, it's a shape. It's just there, and I'm using basic geometric stuff. You could also cut out fancy stuff. I mean, I've made um, this sort of thing where I've, I've uh, just cut out onto some craft foam uh letters and then glue them onto a little piece of cardboard and then that becomes a stamp you know yeah. so um we've got we've got time for one more roll eh? mm -hmm. don't want to bore you guys you guys at home can just leave the zoom but, you guys kind of suck. <laughs> but uh yeah this is you know this is where if you wanted to see this is also interesting too if you just kind of let it do its thing on there the brayer and then this can be used to stamp into that and create, you know, little impressions in there. Um, I didn't bring a whole lot of stuff to stamp with. This is another piece of paper that I produced to stuff with. Pull ink off. You can disrupt the ink in a lot of different interesting ways. Um, is that going to make the letters the reverse image now? The no, end? they will come out the right way. Because you see, they're the right way here, and then they're reversed. And then when you yeah. print it, they're reversed back. It's really, not, that's one of the things that's really nice about jelly paint. Mm -hmm. If you're doing prints in um, a lot of the other things like, uh, uh, Lino cuts, etching, yeah. any of those things, you've got to completely think in reverse. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just going to take care of the sugar down there. So, this is very ill thought of, but you know, I just thought I'd show you the stamp, the stamp type of thing. So. I didn't spend a lot of time in thinking about. That's the first hole. <laughs> and then, and of course, you can always say, oh, I want to save a little bit of texture. So I could always throw some thread on there, get myself a little bit of the white back. Um, there's also, you can do anything at any stage. So, you know, when you put a bunch of ink on the, on the plate, you've got about four prints to play with. You can either just print them straight or you can play with the objects on the plate uh, as you're going. Okay. Yeah. yeah, this, see that kind of makes it interesting. I purposely put the, the letters on here in a nonsensical way. I didn't, I didn't want it to be ABC and yeah. I didn't want it to be a mess. <laughs> However, you could if that was what you wanted to do. I mean, yeah. There's so many things that you could do that. So there you go, guys. I've made a lovely mess here. I've. Uh... <laughs> well, you know, it's it's not that bad. I can clean the brayer by um, just uh, you know cleaning it off on some paper. Uh, although you know at home I do tend to wash it with some soap and water. Um, to clean off the plate, you just basically uh, use uh, water, and if it's really dirty, well, you can give it some soap and water underneath the tap. But um, you know, it's it, in terms of cleanup, it's really pretty. You know.
You can use that for another day. This plate? Yeah. Oh, I've been using this plate for years. Yeah. But I, I do it in spurts, you know, like I, I, it's something that will get put away for a while and then I'll pull it back out. But since I've been going down this rabbit hole, um, I ended up buying a, a 12 by 14 plate. Oh, yeah. And I did, that's what I did the big tree on. And then I finally broke down and bought the 16 by 20. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I, I think it's, it's pretty, pretty. Anyway, so there you go. There's your cleanup. Cool. Throw, away, yes. throw away this sheet and wipe the plate down and you're done. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. 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 So I'm going to just switch this over. And just for anybody who still hasn't fallen asleep at home, I just wanted to um, show you uh, one of my more, my most recent ones. Sorry, guys, walking around. Everybody. So how did you, can I ask a question? How sure. did you get the tree from the gel plate to the oh, canvas? There you go. There's the one I submitted to Cambridge. That's going up to the Cambridge show. Wow. And that was all done with the job. Wow. Uh, there's uh, a few layers. <laughs> so your question was about the about the tree. Well, this is this is the tree that we're referring to. So um, this is part of the stencil. It's not the actual stencil that I used for the tree, but it's part of the stencil. Mm -hmm. So with this, I put this on the plate. I ink the plate, put this on the plate. I use tissue to get rid of all of the paint in the spaces between the branches. Okay. Once I've cleaned off the plate so that there's nothing left in the spaces between the branches, then I'll pull the stencil up and print that. And what I did, because I wanted to go so large, what I did was I printed on tissue and then I collaged it on paper. Um, so that was a job in itself, trying to yeah. get little so branches to line up. <laughs> yeah. uh, so anyway, great. Uh, you want an award with that? Um, the tree? Yes. Yes. Yeah. I got a. I think I, I got an honorable mention or something. Yeah. Yeah. So that's nice because when you're trying something like the whole purpose of the rabbit hole is not to come up with fabulous work. The whole purpose of the rabbit hole was to explore and improve my design skills. So when you finally do come up with something that you think is really cool, and you spend a lot of time creating it, like, you know, doing the whole thing, then it's really nice to have it acknowledged by your peers that, you know, it was something they thought was pretty decent. Mm -hmm. So that was, that was pretty good. So do you have any desire to go back to paint the landscape with acrylic on canvas or used to? Uh, not yet. Not yet. <laughs> not yet. No, I'm sure I'll go back to that. I'm sure yeah. that it'll come back into my practice at some yeah. point. Yeah. But um, I know that I'm going to be spending uh, a lot of time working down this rabbit hole. And uh, right now, uh, what I'm working with is different kinds of materials to print on, uh, presentation, um, combining multiple layers, and, uh, and, and seeing. And of course, you know, you print four, you get one, right? Mm -hmm. No, seriously, you're going to get a fairly high level of what you might call waste. Yeah. They're all informative, but uh, in terms of what you wanted, <laughs> mm -hmm. you set up the plate, you print a bunch, yeah. and then you take out the couple that you think are the best. Because yeah. you can never so, you control it. Do you, yeah. um, the one you showed us at the end was behind glass, was it? Yes, was it the expensive glass. <laughs> uh, but are you finding then then what do you do i mean are you back to putting things behind glass in the well, end i have some ideas like i could simply mount this stuff on a cradle panel but yeah. i want it to have presence mm -hmm. so i'm trying I'm, I'm working on two things right now one is scaling up bigger pieces uh, and then the other is pre presentation. So, I mean, what I'm doing right now is on Jurla, it's transparent, it's translucent. And I'm printing on both sides. And that's interesting. Yay. And then I could present that, not to the FCA, of course, but I could 
put the resulting piece between like two pieces of plexiglass and you could hang it and view it from both sides. Uh, that's a possibility. Um, a light box, that's something I'm really looking into. And you know, they're horribly expensive, but I keep on thinking, well, that would be so cool to have a light box behind the work. So there's all sorts of things I'm thinking about, but yes, I know I'm framing behind glass. <laughs> I was trying, I've always tried to stay away from it. If it's necessary, it's necessary. <laughs> well, the, the interesting thing is some things looks really good with a mat again, you know, it, it centers it, I don't know, it does something. And I miss that when you give up the glass, it's hard. Well, yes, that is a huge thing. So um, I wanted it to have presence. I, you know, if I'm taking a brand new work or taking it to shows, I wanted people to stop and look at it. So yeah, I, I spent quite a lot of money and I cut the mats myself. I've got a mat cover. So I did the double matting and the nice black frame, and the high quality glass. So we'll see where that, uh, where that goes, but it makes shipping really different. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You can have breakage. It's costly, you know. Yeah. Anyway, so yeah. we'll, we'll work on that. <laughs> yeah, well, um, okay. So the material I'm using is highly archival and highly dimensionally stable, like way more so than paper. So the material I'm using doesn't need to be protected. But you can also varnish it, you know, like there's ways of protecting it from UV that don't involve glass, but yeah, there's, I'm still trying to figure all that out. <laughs> no, it wouldn't. So yes, I could do a pour over it. So there's, I don't know if, it, if a caustic would be transparent enough. Like if you do a pour or you use gel or whatever it happens to be, you know, that's, totally clear when it dries, but in caustic, I'm not sure if that would be clear enough. Might be interesting mm -hmm. to combine it with encaustic. Could be quite it interesting. Be like your first bowl, right? Yes. That yes, that's right. It could become part of the process. Yeah. Of another medium to buy. <laughs> <laughs> My husband will be so pleased. <laughs> well, there you go. Anyway. You, if there's no further questions, I'll uh, I'll wrap it up and. Uh... <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks, oh, you're welcome. Really That's been great. So, you. is there any any comments, or any questions from you guys out, out in Zoom land? Or? Just a big thank you. That's lovely. Okay, great. We'll see you all soon. I'm sure. Yep. <laughs> bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you.